Good morning everyone the mic is broken so till the time we fix the mic i request pin drop silence so that you can hear me at the back we'll quickly revise cross validation what we started in the previous lecture before we go on to ensemble learning which is a winning entry in many of the kaggle like competitions so we said the general machine learning workflow is as follows we have a data set we divide that into a training data set and a test data set we train on the training data set which means we learn a model which we then use to make some predictions on the test data set and based on the predictions and the true labels which are coming from the test data we can calculate some error metric or such as accuracy or error we discussed that there were some challenges with this general training workflow what are those what are some problems or some challenges with this workflow yes no we are not currently using the test data to optimize hyperparameters we have not yet talked about optimization of the hyperparameters so that's one flaw given this workflow we cannot optimize hyperparameters second we have not used the entire data set to to show the accuracy or the performance on the test data set it is possible that the data could have been biased and the test data is not truly representative or it's a very small sub sample of the entire data set so to overcome this we first said that let us use the entire data set for training how do we do that how can we use the entire data set for training let me try if this works. how do we use the entire data set for training and testing so we want each and every point in the data set to be tested so one is k fold which is the the process which i said is an efficient one but before that i showed an inefficient procedure which is to do multiple random sub splits multiple random splits of the data into training and testing so instead of saying the first few samples are training and testing we do this multiple times with a different random seed and we saw some code for this also so the first one is we do a 70 30 split so 70 30 split comes in from this way this line of code we say that the test size is 0.3 means 30% use for testing and we have fixed this based on a certain random state but if we want to test on each and every possible train test split not each and every possible over a large number of train test splits we can put a loop and in that loop we can change the random state so this will give us different train test splits and over them we can compute the <coughs> over them we can compute our accuracy measures or our results next we saw a more efficient way to do this which is called k fold cross validation the idea here is that we want to test each and every point in the data set as a test point exactly once and each and every point in the train data set is used how many times k minus 1 times right so if we do this kind of a procedure how many models do we learn k models not a single model what is the final output or what is the final prediction made from the model we have k models right so we can't make a single prediction we'll have k predictions being made and then it's up to you whether you want to do majority vote mean etc and the other point which was missing in the first case that i showed when you just do a single train test split is that we cannot optimize the hyperparameters can someone tell me what do you understand by hyperparameter so we generally talk about hyperparameters as those parameters which we fix before we do the training this was Can you 
can you go to block one and get some batteries? Okay. Block one or block seven. So yeah, both of so two three people can go so that it's quicker. It's very hard for me to speak okay. very loud. You can take. Right, so one of the problems, so we decide, we've discussed one such hyperparameter being the depth of the tree. What could be some other hyperparameter? The criteria based on which you want to make a split, whether it's information gain or something else, that's another parameter that you choose before the training begins. Any other hyperparameter that you're aware of? The minimum samples or some of the things which I'd shown in the notebook which I said you should just look up sklearn documentation to understand. So the way I recommended is sklearn decision tree classifier. If you go to the documentation, you can see that the criteria could be Gini, entropy or log loss. We have in the class discussed entropy, you could use either. The splitter, whether it's the best splitter or a random splitter. So this is the strategy used to split at each node. Should you be splitting based on the best attribute or should you be splitting based on a random attribute. Maximum depth, minimum number of samples, minimum samples leaf, minimum weight fraction, maximum features. So all of these are various hyperparameters which you fix before the training begins. And you can also see that when you invoke the method, decision tree classify, that's where you have to actually specify all of these attributes. If these are not specified, then you take the default attributes. So at the time of the constructor being, or the object being created, we pass these. So if you want to optimize the hyperparameters, you reserve a part of the train data set as a validation data set. Why do we not reserve a part of the test data as validation data? As a general rule, we should never see the test data. Yes, the test data is unknown to us. It's unseen for the model at the time of training. It's only at the time of testing can we see it to evaluate the metrics. Okay, so let's say that our only hyperparameter in this case was the model depth. So we use the training data. We train a model with depth one, two, three, so on and so forth. We get various models. We test the performance of those models on the validation data set. So let's say for depth one, you get 70% accuracy, depth two, 90% accuracy, depth three, 80% accuracy. Which depth model will you use now? Two, because it gives you the maximum performance on the validation data. Now, once you've chosen the best model, you can then use it on the test data set to get the performance. <coughs> and in the notebook, I had shown this. Right, so first simple case, I'll use validation set as a fixed subset of the training data set. So I split my data set, overall data set X and Y into train val test, train val Y test. And then I split this train val into training and validation, right? So split my entire data set into, into two subsets. And the first subset is again split it into training and validation. So therefore you can confirm that the validation data set is a subset of the training data set. I have looked at 500 training examples, 200 validations and 300 testing examples. And I had shown this code. Let's assume that we have three hyperparameters, maximum depth of the tree, minimum sample split, and the criteria could be either Gini or entropy. So I can put nested for loops for maximum depth in, for min samples in, for criterion in this, so that you're looking at all the possible combinations of these three hyperparameters. For each of them, you create this decision tree classifier with the specified hyperparameters, and you fit on the training data set. You evaluate the performance on the validation data set. And for the purposes of simplicity, and I like using Pandas data frames here, I store the entire record in an out dictionary out of count, so count is the total number of hyperparameter combinations you're looking at. Out of count equal to this entire dictionary. And count I'm increasing. If I run through this code and I convert this to a pandas data frame, so this is where I like the conversion a lot, it makes it very simple. I create, I get a hyperparameter data frame which looks like this. So this is the 140 combinations that I've tested for. You can verify that also. So you have 10 and you have 
7 and 2, right. So, total 140 combinations with min max depth min samples criterion. I can sort this entire matrix or this entire data frame by validation accuracy in the descending order and I can see that for max depth 6 min samples 5 criterion Gini, I get the validation accuracy to be 0 0.925. Can you also note that there are multiple such models which give you the same validation accuracy. This is this typically happens when the data set is small or the problem is very easy and we will see the same thing being used as a motivation factor when we study in symbol learning. There can be multiple models which give you the same train, train slash validation accuracy. So then I just found out the best hyperparameter by, so it could have been any of them. I just perhaps look at the first one. So once I've looked at once I've looked at the best hyperparameter, I then use the best hyperparameters to run through my model. So I then use the best hyperparameters. It's a dictionary. I pass those hyperparameters to another training object, and then I fit it on the entire training plus validation data and then I test it on the test data. So I discussed that you could either just use the, you could either fit it or use the model which was trained only on trained data with the best hyperparameters or you could train again on the entire training plus validation data with the best set of hyperparameters, test them on the test data set and then report the metrics. In this case, the test set accuracy is 0 0.90. I also showed last time that we could avoid these nested for loops by using something known as IDA tools dot product. So it's a one liner now. Product will take all the combinations possible. So you'll get 140 combinations in the single for loop. Everything else remains the same. But then one challenge with this approach is that we're still utilizing a same or a simple small reserved portion of the training data set as the validation data set. Could there be some biases in this validation data also? Yes. How do you mitigate those? So currently I've used the last X percent in this in this diagram, not in the code. I've used some last 20 percent, 30 percent of the training plus validation data as the validation data. But perhaps there could be another bias existing here. So what could we do? You could do random choices of which part of the training plus validation data to use as validation data. Now, again, you could do multiple such random splits or could you do a k-fold cross validation here also? Can you divide the training plus validation data into k-folds where you reserve one fold for validation, k minus one fold for training and then you circle through them. That way, again, you have confirmed that each and every point has been used as a validation data. Now, which brings us to the, the paradigm of nested cross validation. So you have, let's say you have an outer loop which divides the data into train plus val comma test data. So you put a k fold here, which would mean that the test data would be circled through in the outer loop. And in the inner loop, you would have the train plus validation divided k times or any number of folds you divide into again train and validation. So let's say that this is showing one particular fold of train and test. Right? So you have first divided the data into train and test or train plus validation into test. That's one outer loop fold. And then for that one outer loop, you have these three, four inner loop folds, right? You divided now the train plus validation into train, validation, train, validation, train, train, validation, train, so on and so forth, right? So therefore then on each 
outer fold, when you get these four inner folds, you compute the validation accuracy across each of them. And then you compute the or you figure out the hyperparameters which work best across these four inner folds and that is the set of hyperparameters that you will use for the outer fold. Okay, so let's look through some code and that should perhaps make it easier to understand this specific aspect. So we have the same set of hyperparameters, 1 through 10 for depth, 2 to 8 for sample split and criterion is gene index or entropy. I have 5 outer folds, the outer folds divide the data into train plus validation comma test. That is what we want to remember. The inner fold divides the data into train and validation from the train plus validation set. So I call this K, KF outer as a K fold and another K fold object and KF inner equal to again a K fold object. I split my data set X comma Y into outer train, outer test and then I split my this outer train data inside a loop using the KF inner object into inner train inner test or inner train comma validation set. And then over this in another level inside now you do this product and you figure out the best set of hyperparameters for each validation data you store all of them. Then you compute the ones which give you the best performance across this loop across the inner fold loop. Right? So there are multiple loops going on here. The outer one is for just dividing the data set into train plus validation and the test. The inner the one fold in a, uh, one loop inside this is for splitting into train and validation. The loop inside this is for iterating over the different hyperparameters. And then inside this loop you will figure out the best set of hyperparameters for this outer fold and then overall you can get for each of the outer fold you will get one best set of hyperparameters. So eventually let me, so you will run this, I will just show the running of the code, outer fold 1, inner fold 1, outer fold 1, inner fold 2, so on and so forth. For each outer fold you run through each of the inner folds and then I have combined the overall results in a huge data frame, 3500 rows and 6 columns, where I stored the outer fold, inner fold, max depth, min sample split, criteria and validation accuracy. So I am assuming till this stage you will be able to get, you can use some different kind of a program, but eventually you will get a data frame which looks like this, right? which has a outer fold column, an inner fold column, max depth or each of the hyperparameters and the accuracy that you get for them. And in the last class, we had once looked at the, the group by operations. Right? So let me show you, let me, let's figure out the best hyperparameters for each of the outer fold. We look at outer fold equal to 0. We can first do a sub selection of the rows corresponding to outer fold equal to 0 by writing something like overall results of query outer fold equal to equal to at the rate outer fold. So in this case, outer fold is this variable and whenever you have to do a query and refer to a variable in pandas, you have to write it with the at the rate symbol. Now if you notice we get 700 rows, which is again a good sanity check because you had total 3500 rows for 5 outer folds. So corresponding to outer fold 0, we will have 700 rows. Now in this, I aggregate the validation accuracy across each of the inner folds. Right? For each of the inner fold, I got some accuracy is corresponding to different set of hyperparameters. So if you look at this outer fold df dot group by on the set of hyperparameters, I find the mean of the validation accuracy across the different inner folds. Right, do you get this? So for the outer folds, so for this data frame now if you look at, I will, so what I will do is let me pick up max, let me pick up max depth, min sample split and criteria. I have three hyperparameters. They for the 
for max depth equal to 1, min sample split equal to 2 and criterion equal to Gini, how many rows do we have? Let me repeat, for this data frame that you are looking at, max depth equal to 1, min splits equal to 2, criterion equal to Gini, how many rows do we have in this data frame? 5, corresponding to what? 5 inner folds. So, across the 5 rows, I take the mean of the accuracy, right. So, you are finding out the mean across the folds for every pair or every tuple of hyperparameters, every combination of hyperparameters. If you do that and you sort by the values, you will see that the best performing hyperparameter is max step 6, min sample split 7, criterion genie which gives you an accuracy, a validation accuracy of 91.75 percent. Again, you get somewhat similar results for the other combinations also, right. So, I think it would always help if you create this kind of a picture in your head and then you look at the various aggregations you want to do. You will first want to figure out the best hyperparameters for outer fold 0, which means that you look at different combinations of the hyperparameters and you have to aggregate them over the inner folds. And then you find out the best hyperparameter for this particular outer fold. You can do the same for the other outer folds also. Right? Questions on this? Yes. Yes. How do we group by? Yes. So, so look at the three hyperparameters, max depth, min sample split, criterion. You choose one particular value of max depth, min sample split and criterion. Let us pick up 1, 2 and Gini. Now, you have 1, 2 and Gini occurs at inner fold 0, occurs at inner fold 1, inner fold 2, inner fold 3, inner fold 4. You have 5 such records for which max depth equal to 1, min samples is 2, criterion is Gini. Corresponding to 5 such records, you have 5 different validation accuracies. So, I pick up one particular value of max depth, min sample split criterion. I look at the 5 records corresponding to the inner folds, look at their accuracies and take the mean over them. Right? And that is the way group by will operate. So, I will not go into all the intricacies of group by because I expect you to spend some time and figure that out. But eventually, the output would be something like this. Right? Sir, all different outer folds will give different best hyperparameters. All different outer folds may give different so which best. You choose? you choose all. So, you have k. So, the question is which best, which set of hyperparameters do you choose? You will not choose a single set of hyperparameters you will choose k different set of hyperparameters because each of the outer fold corresponds to one unique model. You will not have a one best model, you will have k different models. And therefore, when you are giving the results also, as I discussed in the last lecture, you could give either the k results, k tables corresponding to the k folds or do an aggregation over these again, mean and the standard deviation across the different folds. So, this is also one of the question in your first assignment, how to, you have to compute the best, uh, the most optimum depth of the decision tree, right. So, therefore, this would be helpful if you could just go through this notebook on your own time. Other questions? So, now we will move on to more sophisticated models. Till now, we have looked at decision trees. We will be looking at a um, set of models or class of models called ensemble or ensemble methods. We are looking at them because they have been performing very well. Many of them just work out of the box. What, what comes to your mind when I say the term out of the box? We don't expect them to work, but still they do. Uh, not exactly. Any other answer? I mean, they work very well, that is true. What do you understand when I say out of the box? What was something which was concerning to us just 5 minutes back when we are trying to find a good model? The set of hyperparameters. So, in, in 
in a lot of ensemble methods, typically you don't need to tune the hyperparameters much. Out of the box, they give you very good performance with very standard default set of hyperparameters. Just because of the various smart things that they'll do, which we'll look at now. The idea behind ensemble methods is very simple. It's similar to the Kaunmanegakarodpati or similar to who wants to be a millionaire. If I were to ask a question to the audience, more or less the audience poll will be correct. Until unless it's a very vague question or the audience is just trying to misguide the participant. So that's basically the law of the averages. If I ask a lot of people, the majority should be able to get it correct. Even though each of you is not an expert in that field. So the idea is that let's say that we had three different classifiers learnt on the same data set and each of them is reasonably accurate, reasonably diverse kind of a classifier. If I get my accuracies as, if I get my output as good, good and bad, if I use majority voting, I will say that the prediction is good. So even though the third classifier was wrong, but the majority is likely to be correct. And similarly, we can do in the case of regressor, regression. If we get three output as 20, 30, 30 across three different models, if we take the average, it is likely to be working well. But we look at specific conditions in which this works and doesn't work. Okay. Why do you think this kind of an averaging might work well? So in symbol methods, we are looking at some kind of aggregation over different models. Why do you think it might work well? And there are three specific reasons which I'll be looking at from, from this very nice article by Dietrich and Semmel Methods. We're trying out different hyperparameters, different data or something. Okay. So you've said you've hit on two of the points, but more precision in the answer will help. You've you're on the right track. We're trying for different hyperparameters. Your okay. So let me go through the answers now. I think all of you were on the right track. I showed this a few seconds earlier, few minutes earlier. If the data set was small, many competing hypotheses could have been learned. By competing hypothesis in the simple case which you have discussed just now, we saw that multiple trees gave you the same accuracy on the training data. This is also typical in very small data settings, not so typical in huge data settings, which means that, so we could have learned a tree H1, H2, H4, H3 for the same small amount of data, but each of them is not the true tree or the true process which could have generated the underlying data. Now, if you were to, in this, this, this kind of a diagram, consider that the blue points are the ones which give you the same accuracies. The true hypothesis is the F. In some way, if you just aggregate them or take the mean over these hypotheses, you're likely to get the true hypothesis. Right? It may be somewhere along the path where all the different competing hypotheses could have lied. So this is a statistical way of looking at why ensemble methods make sense. There is another reason, computational. Sometimes we use classifies regresses machine learning methods which can get stuck in local optima or apply greedy strategies. Was a decision tree algorithm making certain greedy decisions? What kind? It was looking at the splits. What was the greediness there? It was looking at only that particular level to decide what attribute to split on. That is the greedy part of it. So sometimes such greedy algorithms or optimization algorithms like, which, which we'll look at in this course, gradient descent like methods, they can get stuck in local optima or they make greedy decisions because of which you can have multiple local optimas being learned, all of which give comparable performance. So in that case also, let's say if you were looking at the decision trees employing greedy criteria, none of it will be able to give you the global optima but with different initialization, different kind of changes, you may be able to get reasonably good comparable accuracies across the different models. And this will become more clear when we look at 
things like neural networks, etc., where the problem of local optima is very pronounced. The third reason why ensemble methods make sense is that some classifiers regressors cannot learn very complicated or the true representation of the form. As an example, decision trees only learn axis parallel splits. They can't learn different kinds of lines. They always learn, look at lines which are parallel to the axis. That's how we do the splits. So let's look at this diagram showing two data sets from sklearn's make data sets folder. The first one is the spiral like, the other one is you have an inner circle and an outer circle. The decision tree of depth one would be just a single split. Right? With a single split, do you think you'll be able to get a good accuracy on this kind of a spiral like data set? No, right? Because this tree does not have the representation capabilities to learn sophisticated boundaries. Whereas the method which we look today, random forest, it is based on this decision tree only, but it can learn very sophisticated boundaries, even some boundaries looking like circular boundaries. In this case, you get 85% accuracy. Similarly, for this data set also, you get very poor accuracy with a depth one tree. Of course, if you were to vary the depth, you'll be able to learn better decision surfaces, more capable representations. But at the same time, you're still limited by axis parallel splits. Whereas random forest, if you notice, it's almost making a circular like boundary and it's almost making like a spiral like boundary. So therefore, ensemble methods like random forest, which are based on simpler methods with limited representation capabilities, can give you richer representations. So this is the number, so the gradient of the color here is looking at the, I think the different decision trees that we are plotting. So each of the decision tree, so like on the left hand side you're looking at a decision tree which gives you a boundary and in this case you're looking at multiple such decision trees being learned. So if this is the case that ensemble methods make sense from statistical perspective, they make sense from computational perspective as well as representational perspective. Should we just always use ensemble methods and get always very good accuracy? Or is something missing? What are the conditions in which ensemble methods are likely to work bet better? Okay. Okay. Good. So if, if I were to ask a very difficult quantum physics question over this audience, even though we have a very smart audience here, but because you're not experts there, none of you has even random, you'd be able to random guess that correct answer. So in that case, the ensemble will give us the wrong answer. Each of you on average are expected to give a wrong answer. Right? If I ask a very difficult quantum physics question. So in such a case, the benefit of the audience is not useful. On the other hand, let's say if I were to pick up a very biased kind of an audience, let's say. So let's say if we are a cricket loving country and ask you some question on baseball, right? So all of you are not, like all of you will give me similar answers, which means that the members of the ensemble are not very diverse, right? In our case, we have all engineering background students uh, that way. So we'll, if we don't have diversity, as well as accuracy in our members, we'll not do a good job. So we have these conditions that the members of the ensemble should be accurate as well as diverse. They should be, so let's look at the definition of these accurate classifiers. The accurate classifier is the one which has error rate better than random guessing. If it's as good as random, there is no point in combining multiple random answers. And we say two classifiers slash regressors are diverse if they make different errors on different data points. If they make the same errors on the same data points, then they are basically exactly the same. In which case you don't get the benefit of the wisdom of the crowds. So let's look at a simple example to understand this, this 
sufficient and necessary conditions. If we have three classifiers H1 through H3 and we have a new test point X which we are trying to predict. If each of them is identical not diverse and then when H1 is wrong H2 is also wrong and H3 is also wrong in which case um, prediction from the ensemble is also wrong. But if the classifiers were uncorrelated, decorrelated, if H1 is wrong maybe H2 and S3 may be correct because on average they are better than random in terms of getting the answers correct. So, we can also understand the intuition for ensemble methods from a quantitative perspective. We looked at statistical computational and, uh, and what was the third one? Representational, representational methods, uh, intuition behind why ensemble works. But let us look at a quantitative picture which is a very simplified version of why ensemble methods might work. Let us assume that the error probability of each of the base model in an ensemble is epsilon less than 0.5, it is 0.3. Probability of the ensemble being wrong is that two of the three classifiers give the wrong prediction. Right? That is when the majority is wrong. So, we can say that in the first case we choose two members give the wrong answer, probability of that plus probability of three members giving the wrong answer. So, in that you can apply combinatorics and figure out that the probability of ensemble being wrong is 0.19 whereas the probability of each member being wrong was 0.3. So, therefore, by just using three classifiers each with the error probability of 0.3 we can reduce the error probability from 0.3 to 0.2. Now, let us keep taking this a step further probability that if we choose an ensemble of 21 models probability that the majority vote is wrong 11 out of 21 is wrong is 0 0.026. So, we have gone from the error probability being 0 0.3 to it being 0 0.03. We have gained an order of magnitude of accuracy. Are we missing something? Does this imply that just use always use ensemble learning and you are good? Is this the holy grail of machine learning? This is not a normal distribution, this is some other distribution. Right. Which distribution are we plotting? Right. Binomial. But it is basically equally distributed. Let us say if some distribution is more weighted towards left or more weighted towards right, then that is not possible. Okay, so what Deep is saying is correct, but not exactly precise. So, we are making this assumption that this particular formula that we have written and the binomial <coughs> distribution that we have plotted both of these are only applicable if each of the models is independent of each other. If each of the event is independent of each other then it is when we can apply such probability distributions. But are each of a model independent of the other models? Unlikely. Right? If they are then the ensemble is likely to work extremely well. So, you so that is why we looked at the necessary and sufficient condition you want them to be uncorrelated each of the members you want them to be diverse slash uncorrelated. Second you want each of them to be accurate and both of these conditions will not always be matching especially the fact that many classifiers would be very similar to each other. Therefore, they are not independent therefore, the information you gain by two classifiers will not be such huge information. So, what do you mean by uncorrelated classifiers? I will show you a specific algorithm called random forest where by design we will make them uncorrelated and if you do not understand by that time we will revise it again. I have asked this question in the previous versions of this quiz by the way, the one which we just discussed that if we keep on increasing the, the number of members in ensemble should we just keep always getting better ac accuracy or what is the pitfall? We have also seen the ensemble methods will not work well if the base models are bad which means their errors are greater than 0.5 and each of the models are very similar to each other. So, we look at the first kind of ensemble method which is known as bagging or bootstrap aggregation. <coughs> so, 
So we looked at two major flaws in our machine learning pipelines. One was bias, the other was variance. And these two methods that we'll discuss, bagging and then after that boosting and after that random forest, they specifically target either bias or variance or both. Right? So that's how you make your models better by reducing the variance or reducing the bias. What kind of models exhibit high variance? Sorry, the models which are very specific to the data, uh, but what is the inherent property of such models? They are very complex. They have a lot of degrees of freedom. They can learn arbitrarily complex surfaces on the trained data, but then they don't generalize. Or in terms of variance, because they are so complex, if the training data is modified even a little bit, they will give you very different decision surfaces. So in bootstrap aggregation, we want to reduce the variance. And the question, the simple question which we want to take, uh, take at this point is that we want to feed in the same amount of data, the same data, but we want to learn different classifiers. How can we do that? The data set, the trained data set which is given to you is the same, same let's say 100 points. How can I learn different classifiers on them? One is with different hyperparameters, but for now let's assume that the hyperparameters are fixed. What can you then vary? Randomly choose the data. Right? We have thought about cross-validation earlier. We've seen that, right? So just a few minutes back, Kishan was asking this question that what model do you choose? Uh, if you do cross-validation, you end up with different subsets of the data being used for training and therefore you end up with different models and that's exactly what we're trying to do. We're trying to get multiple models, different models from the same data. The way we got that was with cross-validation. We will do something similar, but we'll look at sampling with replacement. In cross-validation, we would have a specific train test split. Therefore, each sample was seen only once in the train or the test data set. But if we do sample with replacement, we can end up with a data set of size n with different rounds where we can have some repeated entries. So what we say is each round corresponds to a new data set which we have sampled with replacement from the original data set. Original data set at n equal to let's say 100 points. Our data set could have been d1, d3, d6, d1, so on and so forth, 100 points again. Right? But because we are doing sampling with replacement, there is a possibility that we can have some entries being repeated. In this case, entry D1 has been repeated two times. They can also be multiple times each entry has been repeated. And each such round we'll call as a bagging round. We'll look at this data set to understand why ensemble methods might work well and how bagging will work. So we have this data set where we have two points which are anomalies. This point 3, 3 should have been a yellow and this point 5, 8 should have been a purple point, but they are currently the opposite class. If I were to learn a decision tree with the depth 6 or any without any depth control, I might learn a surface like this. Does this exhibit high amount of variance? How? If I were to change even one point, the entire surface would change. And on the other hand, the other definition of variance is that it's tuned very specifically to the training data set. And it is not going to generalize well. Let's now learn bagging. Uh, let's use bagging or bootstrap aggregation with an ensemble of five different decision trees. Importantly, we are using these different rounds where we are doing sampling with replacement. So you can see that in round one, we have some of the points which are missing because we have done sampling with replacement and since some of the points are missing, it also means that some of the points have been repeated multiple times. So original data set has size n, the new data set also has size n, but with replacement. So therefore, we are able to get a data set which looks sparser than the original data set. We see another data set in round two, round three, round four, and round five. So 
So we can see that there are five different data sets or rounds of data set being used. Now, if I learn a tree, decision tree on each of them without any depth control, because I want the model to be showing high amount of variance. For round one, I end up looking at this tree. So I've not put any depth control. So I can make the tree as complex as possible. In this case, for round one, the tree of depth four is chosen. And round two, depth five, round three, depth five, round four, depth two, and round five, depth four. So you can notice that each of these decision trees on average looks to be correct. Right? Mostly it's able to get this region correct. Some of them get this region wrong and some of them get this region wrong. But we had five such classifiers. I'd purposefully chosen five as an odd number. Now let's take an average of the prediction from each of the models. Can you see that the average prediction might look like this? Let's go back. So if you look at this point, in round one, it's classified as red. In round two, purple. Round three, purple. Round four, red. Round five, red. Three out of the five times, we have predicted it to be the yellow or the red class. So the majority is correct. Similarly, for this point, only two out of the five times is it wrong. So three out of the five times, it's still correct. So on average, we are able to get <coughs> A right prediction for these two sort of anomalous points. So therefore, by combining these different classifiers, we will get an average prediction which has now reduced the variance. Any question in bagging? The question is that, will there be a bias in the specific data? So that we're doing on purpose, so that we're able to reduce the variance, so that you're able to not learn any pattern which is specific to one small portion of the data. If you look at different subsets of the data, again, you'll be able to find out a data set which is more or less representative of the entire data set. Right? Because of the subsets, you'll perhaps, in this case, if you look at the different rounds, right? you have you have been able to, by looking at these different rounds, you've been able to create an average kind of a data set, which is, which misses out on certain very intrinsic, uh, certain very outlier kind of points in this. So what is sampling, with replacement? sampling with replacement means that for each, let's say you wanted to sample 100 points. At point number one, so at the first point, i equal to zero, you look at I have 100 candidate points, I'll pick up one of them. Once I picked one of them, let's say it was ninth point, I put, I put nine back in the, in the bag, and for the first point, the n, n equal to one point that I want to choose, again, I have 100 possibilities to choose. I pick something up, put it back in the bag. Again, I, for the next point, I have 100 possibilities. That is sampling with replacement. Is it that always the setup such that all the rounds, the input to the number of rounds that we take, all has equal weighting? Okay, so the question is that, should we assume equal weightage? In this case, we do, because of the statistical properties, the way we have just defined sampling with replacement. But there are other methods, which we'll see five minutes down the line, which give different weightage to different classifiers. In this case, we just assume all of them to be equally likely to work well. And we have used very sophisticated models in each of them. Okay, the question is that the same point is not going to give you any additional information. Actually, the same point will give you because you can think of the same point as two different points, although they're at the same location. So they will be contributing to the overall probabilities of positive and negative, right? Or the probability, or they'll also be contributing to the entropy calculation, even though they're located at the same point. So if you were to look at a split, 
we were to maybe make a split over here, somewhere around here. But this is perhaps not just one, one point. So if we make a split over here, we want to see the ratios of purples to, or let's say we make a split over here. Okay. So we will be looking at the ratios of the purple is to yellow. If that point is occurring twice, it will contribute twice to the, or you can think of it as two distinct points, but at the same location. Just one second. Sorry, I didn't get you. How is it? So one sampling with displacement gives you certain mathematical guarantees, which you won't get if you don't do without that. And secondly, with the replacement, you are likely to pick up on the certain specific, like you're able to largely pick up the majority trend of the data. If you didn't do sampling with replacement, if you just did sampling, you can again pick up certain other properties, certain points with more probability. Yes, 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 yes. So cross validation was trying to serve a different purpose. We are not trying to reduce the variance while using cross validation. Here the purpose is specifically to reduce the variance because of which we require certain properties of independence and we require certain properties of the majority of the trend being picked up while training. Cross validation again, remember the purpose is to validate, pick up the hyperparameters as well as test out the model. Here we're not doing that. Here we just want to learn a good data set and uh, sorry, a good model by reducing the variance. The variance is coming in from models being out of control, means they have a very high sophisticated uh, representation capabilities. Just to do that, we want to pick up the majority trend. By doing this, we're able to do that. There are other more rigorous answers to this. Perhaps if you want, I can send some links or share that in the next class. So, in the previous lectures, we discussed that whenever there's always a trade-off between variance and bias. So, what can you say spell us where are we increasing the bias here? Uh, is it that when uh, multiple points we are taking So bias is the capability to learn the data very well. Now you can notice that our, our new model or bias is with respect to the accuracy that you can get on the train data. Here the accuracy on the train data is not 100%. Whereas if you didn't do bagging, the accuracy on the train data was 100%. That's how we've increased the bias but we have reduced the variance slightly. Any other question? Okay. So in short, what we have done is taken very strong learners. By strong learner, I mean which, is, which has a high degree of sophistication or exhibits high variance. We combine them in a very specific way to reduce the variance. We also assume, or sorry, not assume, we have each of the learner being independent of each other. What do you think is the benefit of each of the learner being independent of each other or learnt independent of each other? They're not independent of each other exactly. Sorry? They give you some diversity, but I'm thinking more in terms of implementation benefits. Can you run each of them on a separate core? Right? So you have five different data sets. You can learn five different models on five different cores. That will give you some parallelization benefits. You don't have to learn them on the same code. There is no sequentiality between these. No ordering or relationship between each. Okay. So now we have seen how to reduce the variance of very strong models. The next class of ensemble methods is called boosting, where we take weak learners and we try to reduce the bias. So we are addressing both the bias and variance by different class of algorithms. And in the previous case, I said that the learners were all independent of each other. So you could use uh, parallel processing to learn them. In boosting, we want to improve a simple weak classifier. So we incrementally make it stronger. So therefore, there is a sequential nature to this algorithm. So our main idea would be to classify harder samples correctly 
in each pass as we go forward. Let us take a data set, let us assume it has n equal to 10 samples. Initially we say that each sample i has weight w i and the first iteration is 1 over n and we will be using m capital M classifiers in the ensemble. So, what could be a very simple uh, classifier that we can use on this data set because that is the purpose of boosting. We take simple classifiers and we make them more complicated. What could be a very simple classifier that you can use? This is the dividing. Sim, uh, depth. 0 depth 1 decision tree, something like that. It is also called a decision stump. So, firstly we initialize the weights of each of the sample to be 0.1. What we would expect is that as we go on through the iterations of this algorithm, the weights of harder examples will increase, the weights of easier examples we will reduce. Right? So, let us Assume that we learnt a very simple decision tree, depth 1 tree, we just make one split. Does this look like a good split to you? Why not? What could be a better split? So, let us just add the weightage of points which are incorrectly classified. In this case, in this split, it is 0.3. Can you give me something else which is better than 0.3? Moving it by just another point could have given you 0.2, yes. Yeah. But let us for now assume that this was the best split that we got. We can notice that three points are misclassified. We can compute the weighted error for this iteration as the weights of the samples which are incorrectly classified divided by summation of the weights of all the samples. So, that would be 0.3 divided by 1. So, we say that the weighted error for this iteration is or this ensemble member is 0.3. What we will calculate is some quantities, we will look at why these specific quantities. Alpha 1 equal to half log 1 minus error at the mth iteration divided by error at the mth iteration. So, it is half log 0 0.7 by 0 0.3, it comes out to be 0.42. Now, for the samples which are correctly cl classified, we want to reduce the weight. For samples which are wrongly classified, we want to increase the weight. So, therefore, for the correctly classified ones, we do w i into e to the power minus alpha m. For the wrongly classified one, w i into e to the power alpha m. So, this is the calculation. Point for all the correctly classified ones, point 0.1 because that is the weight initially into e to the power minus 0.42 and for the wrongly classified one 0.1 into e to the power point plus 0.42. If we do this, the new weights would be 0 0.06 and 0 0.15 for all the points, but do the sum up to 1. So, then what next step should we be taking? Normalizing or just ensuring that the sum up to 1. So, we will do normalize w i's to sum up to 1, after which they will become 0 0.07s and 0.17s. Now, we want to repeat the same exercise, but taking into consideration the weights of the points as before. In the first iteration, each of the point was equally weighted. So, it we did not really care about, we just looked at the total number of points. What classify do you think or what split do you think now you will choose? No, we can only make, we cannot choose a line with a slope because we are just using a decision tree depth 1. So, you can just tell me parallel to the x axis or parallel, parallel to the y axis? Parallel to the x axis, do we make it here? Let us see, if we make a split here, now you can again notice that three points are misclassified 0 0.07, 0 0.07, 0 0.07, 0 0.07. Can you see that the weights, the sum of weights of misclassified points is now 0.21? In the first case, it was 0.3. So, it has now reduced. It means that we have moving in the right direction. We again compute these alpha values. Alpha 2 equal to half log 1 minus 0.21 divided by 0.21, which comes out to be 0.66. I again calculate this 
w i into e to the power minus alpha m and w i into e to the power plus alpha m. We multiply these coefficients and this is a new set of weights that I get after normalization. Where do you think our next split should be? Our we have two points which are wrongly classified or which have a high weightage now. This one 0.16 and this one point sorry this one and this one with 0.16. So, where do you think the next split is likely to be? Parallel to the x axis, parallel to the y axis. Y axis where? Does this look reasonable? So, if we make a split over here, we have few points which are misclassified in this case just three points which are misclassified. The weights are 0 0.04, 0 0.04, 0 0.04. I add them up, the error for the third classifier or the third iteration of boosting is 0.12 and the alpha coefficient that I get is half log 1 minus 0 0.12 divided by 0 0.12 which comes out to be 0.99. What we are seeing is that the alpha values, if you notice, for the first classifier, the alpha value that we got is 0.42, the second one is 0.66, the third one is 0.99. So, one we see that the alpha values are increasing, third we see that the, the wrongly classified samples, their weight increases and the correctly classified samples, their weight is decreases is going to decrease. So, that is the main crunch of the algorithm. How do we make the final prediction now? We have three different very simple classifiers, each of them associated with some alpha value and each of them being just a decision stump. How do we give one final prediction from this ensemble? We can make slant like lines, but just for the purposes of illustration for this particular lecture, I am using the simplest algorithm. So, boosting works best when models exhibit high bias and you are trying to reduce them by making certain incremental versions of them. Of course, you can use boosting on more sophisticated algorithms also, but not for this trivial example that I am showing. You can make. Sorry. Uh, oh, so, oh, so if your question is that can we make a slant line with a depth of 1, so decision trees will always make axis parallel splits. You cannot choose uh, y equal to x line splits in decision trees. What you are doing is something like logistic regression, which is you can make some splits which are linear, but not in this algorithm. Of course, boosting is very general, it is a meta algorithm, you can learn it on top of any simple baseline algorithm. Just for the purposes of illustration, I am using the simplest decision stump. So, <coughs> yeah, we can take alpha as the weight and take the weighted sum of the predictions from each of the model. In increasing the depth, the bias will go away. Okay, so does anyone want to answer Kishan's question? Why are we doing this all of this, uh, this complicated things? Why not just increase the depth of the tree? Anyone? <coughs> so, in this trivial case, it looks like you should just increase the depth of the tree, but there are many cases of even sophisticated models which will exhibit a high amount of bias. Right? So, in order to reduce the bias, you could either use a very complicated model which you may end up with a high amount of variance or maybe it is very sophisticated to fit on your model, on, on your device. So, therefore, you end up choosing a simple enough model and try to make it more sophisticated. So, at every depth, we do the boosting and then again increase the depth. Uh, so, his question, follow up question is that do we do boosting at every depth? So, if the model already exhibits high amount of variance, then you do not, there is no benefit of doing boosting. You have to use boosting with very simple algorithms. That is the baseline, that is the way it is implemented. So, so, think of this as whenever your model exhibits high amount of bias and you are somehow not able to control or 
the, the complexity, you're not able to increase the complexity or choose a model with more complexity, you can then perhaps use something like boosting to make it more sophisticated. How do we know at which depth should I boost? The question is how do we know at which depth should I boost? I think it's a, I don't really think it's a science where I can give you definitive answers. One, use, look at methods like uh, cross-validation to figure out your train and validation accuracies, understand if the model is becoming too sophisticated. The other, it's, it's a piece of art, like you learn it through observation, you learn many of such things by practice. So because you've asked this question, I shared one very nice article No, sorry, not this one. In my yesterday's note to some of the students. This is a very nice article. Deep neural networks 33 years ago and now, while we're not doing deep neural networks at this point of time, but this article shows that this is a, a paper from Jan Likon in 1989, back propagation applied to handwritten zip code recognition. So this is the article which introduced a lot of very nice, interesting things. But this is, in, in the world of neural networks, this looks very similar to MNIST-like data set, right? Because this is the way, this is where all of MNIST-like data sets started and a very simple architecture. The reason I'm showing you this is, so Andrew Karpati very specifically shows each and every process of how you can go out and figure out one complexity that you add to the model in order to make it better. So he talks about can you add more data? Can you choose a different loss function and gives intuition as to why certain things might work? So I think going through this article will give you some more sense as to how people typically think in terms of tuning their models better. And when you'll read this, you'll understand a bit of this is science, a bit of this is art. Other questions? Okay, we now want to make a final prediction. I'll say that the, <clears throat> let's assume it's a very simple binary classification problem. We look at the prediction to be the sum of the weighted predictions and then we like look at it whether it's plus or negative. So I'll say the, the blue class to be positive and the yellow class to be negative, let's say, plus one and minus one. So I have my alpha one into h one of x plus alpha two h two of x plus alpha m h m of x. The way to think about this is, uh, this is the first classifier for which alpha one was 0.42, second one alpha 2.66 and alpha three equal to 0.99. You have to consider the prediction for this point. So what would you say? Let's assume blue to be plus one and yellow to be minus one. So the first classifier, does it predict to be blue? Right. So 0.42 into plus one. The second classifier, does it predict to be blue? Yes, plus 0.66 into plus one. The third classifier predicts it to be negative. So plus 0.99 into minus one. If you aggregate this, so 0.42 plus 0.66, 1.08 minus 0.99, 0 0.09 which is plus. So overall we would predict this point to be blue, which kind of makes sense also here. So some intuition behind the weight update formula now. We had this alpha m, right? Alpha m is corresponding to the weightage you want to give to a classifier. You'll see that if error in the mth round is close to 0.5, the weightage that you give to that classifier is zero. It, there is no benefit because your classifier is now almost as good as random. Whereas if the error in the mth iteration is very low, you can give a lot of weightage to this classifier. That's how the formula was being used, half log one minus error m upon error m. We should be just considering the region less than 0.5. If it's greater than 0.5, you should just stop. The second was, once you have chosen an alpha m, you have figured out an alpha m, you use that as a weight multiplier for that particular iteration for the correct and wrongly classified points. For the 
correctly classified points, you see that if error of M is, let's say, 0.3, you will reduce the weightage of the correctly classified point by some fraction and increase the weightage of the wrongly classified points by some factor. If the error of M has become very low, which means that there is perhaps a very small subset of the points, subset of the points, which are wrongly classified. So you increase the weightage of all the wrongly classified points by a large quantity in order to somehow get them correct. And you reduce the fraction, the weight of the correctly classified points by a large quantity. This of course would beg some questions as to what if that point is an outlier, right? So just for simplicity, we are not talking about outliers as of now because an outlier will just make this whole calculation wrong. Okay, As one question for you. We have looked at the case of classification as of yet, where we could easily compute this quantity. Error of M equal to sum of weights of incorrectly classified samples divided by sum of weights. How do we adapt this algorithm to work for regression? We don't really get a correctly classified or wrongly classified there. What do we do? Again, this was one of the questions which I've asked earlier in the exams. Why, uh, for around, why not create a region or a boundary uh, around the correct value? Mm -hmm. And if, let's say, around that, if our prediction falls in that area, we can assume it as direct. If not, we can uh, predict or we can give it the value as well. Okay, so Deep says that let's consider a radius around that particular region and assume within a particular threshold, you are correct, otherwise you are wrong. There are multiple ways in which you can do, including one of the way which he has told. The one which scikit-learn uses is this algorithm called adaboost.r2. It figures out the maximum error that you get on all the points, right? And then you compute the li value, the loss value as a fraction of the error compared to the largest value that you can get. And then you do something more sophisticated, but eventually you will get this form only, beta equal to L hat over 1 minus L hat, which is similar to what we get over here, 1 minus error R divided by error of M. Again, I'm not going into the details of this. This was just to show you that it's possible to do this in regression. I would leave this as an exercise for you to study. I have left this paper as a note. Now, before we go on to random forest, does any of you wonder how we will be able to learn a decision tree with such weights? Thus far, decision trees we have been using is one full point, right? unweighted or uniformly weighted decision trees. But now, we are trying to learn a decision tree of varying depth or in this case depth equal to 1, but each of the point has a weight. How do we go about that? Good. You will have to add that weightage information gain. How do you compute the probabilities to calculate entropy in the first case? If you can calculate entropy, you are more or less there. Let me repeat my question with a trivial example. So this is a simple kind of a data set we've been using thus far for decision trees. Given this data, where would you make the first split? Parallel to the x-axis, y-axis, at x equal to what? Yeah, maybe this point, maybe this point, something like that you'll make. But now each of the point has a different weight. How will you factor this? So previously, if I didn't give you the weights, you would probably say that x1 equal to 6 is the boundary. Now I've given you the weights. Would x1 equal to 6 make sense? What should be the boundary? Uh, 
how do you how do you go about such things such questions we could have multiple points at the same location you can have multiple points at the same location Yeah, that's how we think about such calculations. We think of these points as being fractional, right? Or just imagine in this simple case, you multiplied each of the weight by 10. So you, now you can have three points at the same location. So this is how we'll compute the probabilities of pluses and negatives to calculate the entropy as well as information gain. We look at entropy to be minus pros, probability of plus, log base to probability of plus, minus probability of negative, log base to probability of negative. Probability of plus is now calculated based on the weighted fractions, uh, weighted sorry, so weighted samples. So the plus if you see is 0 0.3, 0 0.1, 0 0.1 divided by the total which is 1. So probability of plus equal to 0 0.5, probability of negative equal to 0 0.5. Entropy is minus half log base to half minus half log base to half which comes out to be 1. If I have to now calculate the weighted entropy. Let us consider this, uh, this as a candidate x1 equal to 4, I can look at the left hand side of this. The probability of plus here is 0 0.2 divided by 0 0.5 and the probability of negative is 0 0.3 divided by 0 0.5. So therefore, I can calculate the entropy of this set. Similarly, I can calculate the entropy of this set which is probability of plus is 0 0.3, uh, sorry 3 over 5 probability of negative is 2 over 5. And then when I calculate the information gain, I can calculate that to be the entropy of the overall data set which was 1 minus 0 0.5 into entropy of this set minus 0 0.5 into the entropy of this set. Right? So that is how you will go about and calculate the entropies for the case when you have fractional weights or you have any weightage. Okay. Any questions? Okay, we will end today's class at this point. Next class we will start with random forest and hopefully with linear regression.